How'd you like my penis?
Hope you liked that tune. That was Scales of Justice, the rarely played Scales of Justice by Max the Axe. Rarely played due to its length, but uh, I started a little early today. And you might be wondering to yourself, hey, isn't it? <laughs> hey, Ralph, how you doing, buddy? Happy uh, one-year anniversary to Ralph's Rock Shop. Sorry I was not able to send in a video. I just uh, couldn't get my shit together in time, but happy one-year anniversary. And yeah, so Chris is saying, you know, nice summer cut, but uh, <laughs> um, the thing is, shaving my head works in the winter as well. Ralph is an awesome dude. Check out the Rock Shop on Facebook. Great show. He's got dudes on like Vinnie Apice and uh, Carmine Apice. He's got the fucking best. Um <laughs> Losing track of my thoughts here. Anyway, it's a winter haircut for this reason. Because I really hate... I, I wake up at 6.30 in the morning, jump in the shower, go to work. I really hate going outside with wet hair. Do not like it, my friend. Do not like it. So, what we Canadians do... This is called a toque. It's called a toque, which is also the name of a band. A Canadian band. Um, but yeah, this is what we do in Canada. This takes care of any issues. Thank you, Lana. Really appreciate that. It takes care of any issues that you have with the head. And I'm not going outside with wet hair. I wonder how many times in the past I've gotten sick because I went out with wet hair all the time. Anyway, not a summer dew. This is the winter dew. And uh, I love it. I love it. Take off, eh? Take off, hoser. Chris, Chris thus knows. That was just some Canadian slang for you, since uh, we have two Americans in our viewer uh, viewer group tonight. And, and yeah, Ralph knows what I'm talking about. He does the he does the clean shave all year round, and it's great in the summertime. It's absolutely great in the summertime. Um, what I don't know is in the winter time in australia do they get like as much cold and snow as we do because i'm wondering if like harrison has the same problem if he gets up in the morning and he's going outside with wet hair you know it's not good in the winter time why don't we ask him i'm curious let's bring on Hey, 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 
Hello, hello. How are you? Good, thanks. And you? Great. So actual serious question for you. Tell us about winter in Australia. Is it as harsh as Canadian winter? No. It depends on the seasons differ if you're where I am on the west or if you're over east where like everyone else is. Although technically because I'm on the west, everyone, everything else is just over east. But um, in the west here, we get really hot, really dry summers, which I hate. And we get rainy winters, but no snow. I think the lowest we get is like one degree Celsius you know, thereabouts, and that's okay. at, like, night and stuff. But then over east, you do get snow in the mountains, and their summers are much more humid and rainy, and their winters are more, I guess I'd say, arid and cold in that regard. Dry and cold. Yeah. yeah dry. Where I am, it's wet and cold. <laughs> <laughs> I see you have Galvatron behind you tonight. Yes, he's technically a replacement. Is that Kingdom Galvatron? Yeah, yeah. At the end of the show, can we take a closer look at him? <laughs> yes, we can. Awesome, awesome. I have Scourge and Cyclonus too, but they're over there. Now, if you if you compare uh, the leader of the Decepticons, if you did compare the Decepticons to a rock band, the leader of the Decepticons would be the lead singer. And in a sense, Galvatron would be a replacement lead. Yeah, um, which is my horrible segue into tonight's theme. Yeah, Rodimus would have been a better choice, but he's currently in space Winnebago mode. So okay, fair enough. I won't, not yeah. as good for display. Well, maybe we'll take a look at a, at a couple of these toys at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot remember who came up with the idea of doing the top five replacement singers. Possibly me. Maybe Jon Snow, actually. It could have been John. I guess we'll wait and see what he says when he's on. Because he will be joining us shortly. Um, oh, he is on deck. Um, now, I, I just want to say one one cool thing. Uh, this we, we tried to do this show a while ago, but I couldn't. I had to cancel at the last minute. Um, we got so much feedback just on the idea of replacement singers and everybody like it was, it got a lot of people really psyched for the show, which is, which is great. But on the flip side, everybody said the same names, <laughs> Ian Gillen, uh, Bruce Dickinson, all these guys that are obvious, Sammy Hagar. And we're like, okay, if we did a top five, like a true top five with Dio and all these other guys, it would be we'd all five we'd have all five the same you know like there are well, there are certain singers that me, are, but... with that not me but everyone else would be the same not you right but that's just because you're his his name is ironic this evening uh, <laughs> but um you know there's certain singers that you don't even have to question as as the greatest replacement singers of all time absolutely ronnie james dio absolutely sammy hagar Absolutely, Ian Gillen, Bruce Dickinson, and that other guy that I mentioned earlier, and or in my on my post on my page, I named a few. Um, regardless, I I likened it to the Mount Rushmore of rock of replacement singers. You know, there's certain guys that are written in stone. There's no point in even listing them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go just a rung lower on the ladder. Brian Johnson was the other one. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Um, I like Van Halen, not Van Hagar. That is a line from the movie Joe Dirt. Hmm. Chris Thus likes to speak in movie quotes, and that is exactly what that Oh, is. you talk TV. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> we talk TV. Um, you're right. So anyway, we're going to go a rung lower in the ladder and pick the top five replacement singers that aren't those guys that everybody always names, because there's no point in us just regurgitating it. Let's go a little level deeper. So rather than this being like, the best of the second place singers. I look at this as maybe a deeper look at the greatest lead singers of all time. Um, do we have any questions, Harrison? Do we have any questions before we begin? Um, nope. Okay. I'm going to do one, one quick thing before we uh, run the intro and bring on John. Um, I, it's been a slow week at LeBrain Central because uh, Christmas is coming and we're shopping for other people and not ourselves. Uh, but I did get a couple of new arrivals here, 
And actually, they came from a guest who's been on the show before. Surprise guest, actually. It was uh, uh, Dave Lismy of the Four Horsemen. Um, I uh, ordered a couple of discs from him. He, he uh, gave me a phone call the other day. <laughs> Um, so I decided, Hey, why not? We'll, we'll, we'll order some stuff from, from his website. So I still needed the, uh, death before suck ass live DVD. I still needed that. And this is a remaster version of getting pretty good by barely getting by, by the four horsemen. And it includes three unreleased demos that I've never had before. Uh, live in these blues, mm -hmm. keep your life and hit the road. And the CDs arrived within like a week of me ordering them. So, you know, Thanks, Dave. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> if you mention Dio again, I will stab you in the neck with a soldering iron. That sounds painful. All right, so let's uh, let's get the show on the road and let's bring on Mr. John T. Snow, who is uh, joining the panel tonight as the uh, third man on deck. Let's rock and roll. I was wondering what your shirt says. Uh, need to breathe. Oh yes, you've been you've been talking about them on your site for quite a while. Yeah, I went to the concert last month. Yeah, must be nice being back in concert land. It is. I've done two. I did Alice Cooper with Ace Frehley and uh, Need to Breathe. That's awesome. Well, I'm hoping need to breathe maybe next year. Yeah. I wouldn't know because no one ever comes here. Yeah, it's Aww. too expensive. Damn it. Yeah. No, don't don't bring us down right from the beginning, Harrison. Tonight is a what? rock show. Hey, T Bone's in the house. Hey, T Bone. He does all of the music that you've uh all of our theme music. And uh actually he'll we'll be playing the Cinco de Listo theme just before we we kick it off. But uh John, you heard everything we were saying earlier, I guess, about uh sort of our ground rules tonight for the replacement singers. Yeah, so I threw my list out and I've started again. I'm trying to get it get it ready. <laughs> I I sincerely hope you're joking. I think you I am joking. Okay, <laughs> great. We're gonna get you a theme song. Um first thing I just want to say real quick is did you come up with this idea? Because we can't remember whose idea yeah. this was. It I think was I you. threw it out a, a while back. And uh, yeah, like you said, we were gonna do it and then Things happened and we weren't able to do it back in October. Right. Now, uh, you and Harrison both have been keeping a list of runners up, I think, too, right? I do. I have a, a ton. 
Good, good, good. That you know what? As as we uh, refine and and play with the Cinco de Listo format, one of my favorite features is actually the runners up at the end. Some really great names and bountiful discussion. Hope so. Anyways, um, <laughs> without further ado, why don't we get started? We're going to do the top five replacement singers that aren't those other guys tonight on the LeBrain train. Let's do it. Five, four, three, two, one. You got my big guys in a baseball. Stink out to this go. The pentagram made a crystal. Stink out to this go. Love that. <laughs> Thanks, T Bone. <laughs> All right. So, as we do things here, we start with the man to, I guess that would be my right. And uh, I'm actually pointing left, which makes it confusing, but that's the man <laughs> to my right. We will start with his number five. All righty. This is from the band of a thousand singers. That's Black Sabbath. Ah, okay. Yeah. And this individual, I mean, I, I could list any of the seven or eight singers that were, in, except maybe David or an Aussie. But um, the one I've gone joined Sabbath for their touring lineup in 1986 uh -huh. is a fellow by the name of Ray Gillen. And his singing is probably my favorite of all the Sabbath singers. He's a bit like Dio, but more suited to a wider range of eras. He doesn't sound as over singing on the Aussie era as Dio does. And it's funny that you mentioned like everyone said that Tony Martin was like a Dio clone. Cause I always thought Ray Gillen was like the Dio clone, but there are far worse things to be a clone of. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then he, he, he were only stuck around for that tour and the recording sessions of eternal idol where he jumped ship before it was released. And then they got in a fellow by the name of Tony Martin to redo the vocals. Uh -huh. And I'm kind of surprised that your pick wasn't Tony Martin, unless you're coming back to Black Sabbath, which no spoilers. Let's not, that's, <laughs> well, just, me, that's just me expressing myself here. But uh, no, I, I, I love your pick. Uh, Ray Gillen didn't occur to me, but um, now, of course, for those of you who are wondering, you can get, Black Sabbath with Ray Gillen today on the Eternal Idol Deluxe Edition. And the Seven Star Deluxe Edition, except it's so hard to find that you can't really. Right. Um, that one has uh, a live set when Ray Gillen, mm, he basically he replaced Glenn Hughes. Yeah. And um, I think the story goes that, that uh, he he was kind of like in the wings and Glenn just wasn't able, able to perform. So it was like, okay, here's black Sabbath's new singer kind of sudden, you know what I mean? And yeah. um, for whatever, what whatever heard, reason uh, it didn't work out heard, in the studio. Sorry. Yeah. Um, if for Glenn Hughes getting replaced, I heard that he copped a punch at, at like there, there ish and the blood sort of messed with his vocal cords a bit. Uh, I don't know why he jumped ship other than, you know, the band that weren't very successful at that point would be my guess. And he was about to join Badlands, which, you know, they were kind of, there was a lot of buzz. Yeah. John remembers, right? Oh yeah. That was, that was huge. Yeah. In a way. Um, no, never mind. I'm getting my stories mixed up. I think I was going to say Ray Gillen was a replacement singer in Badlands as well, but that's untrue. He, I think he was in line to be in blue murder at one point though, wasn't he? I'm not there's sure. There's some mixing up. There's some mixing and matching. Tony Martin yeah. was involved with that Blue Murder record as well, I believe. I know Ray Gillen was also a uh, part of a very early incarnation of Sabotage. But that's not... Ray, I didn't know that, but Ray Gillen does sing background vocals on uh, the track Strange Wings from Hall of the Mountain King, which is one of my favorite mm. tracks on one of my favorite albums. There's also a... Um, 
uh, a bootleg out there of him singing three songs live, uh, Heaven and Hell, which was a, a bit of foreshadowing there. Mm -hmm. uh, another piece of me and Led Zeppelin's rock and roll. Interesting. Yeah, that, and, uh, I think that one made my bootleg list. I also had a C. I, I I still have. I just haven't played it in probably two twenty years. But uh, Sun Red Sun, it's a three CD set, and I think Gillen sings lead vocals on one of the three discs. It was a band that he was involved with. It, uh, Mike Starr from uh, Alice in Chains, I think, was also involved with it. But uh, I'm gonna have to dig it out, and, and we'll talk about it another time. Let's move on to John's mm -hmm. number five. All right, my number five. He. He was the third singer for Axie Rudy, Axel Rudy Pale. He was kind of, he was, now how do you, technically, first album for Talisman, he was the singer on it. But they had a singer before that did all the demos, and then he came in. That counts. And was with them the whole entire time, did every album. So I don't know if that's technically a replacement, but I Axel so. definitely is. And then he spent a tour as the lead singer of Journey. So I'm thinking here, Jeff Scott Soto, mm -hmm. I know I'm also a shameless plug since I'm starting a series on him yeah. coming up. But yeah, his um, vocals for Journey were incredible. I've got a bootleg of an Atlanta show. Yeah, me too. And he can nail the Steve Perry songs. Yeah, He can do Queen as well. Uh, yes, Lana, I always have props. <laughs> It's always fun. Uh, so that's who um, that's who my pick is for number five. Um, I had to go so far down on the list. You know, I didn't want to make him number one and and just you know shamelessly right. deliberately plug my series. But you know, I well, I, I will say this. And you know what? I'm going to put the picture up on the screen here because there's an incredible picture that John took of his collection and um, his his uh, Jeff Scott Soto collection. That is. And I just want to put it up here on the screen. I, I, I sent you a message earlier, but you didn't answer me. Is this, did you have to like go on a step ladder or something to take this picture? Oh, I did answer. I, there's an ottoman here in my office and I stood up on top of the ottoman and took a picture down that way. Okay. Here's the photo. There it is. Look yep. at that. Look at that collection. And that's, you said there's more coming as well in your there are, collection. That's about 60 or 60 so and i have another one here that wasn't in and then i have two others back here somewhere that i did not have at the time so you are doing this at uh, one review a week uh i'm gonna no it might work out that's maybe three a month to four a month but not necessarily one every week so we are talking about a project that will not end until sometime in early 2023 23, yeah oh my god i love it i love it i love it oh john you know I, and again just to keep plugging plugging his series a little bit here harris and i were talking about you the other day and um good things I, good things, good things. I, I can't remember what what word we used i referred to him as a machine i think i also called him a madman but uh we both agreed like you are doing all these series simultaneously so you are currently reviewing queen well no, queen's done oh queen's done sorry aerosmith aerosmith um uh, i'm drawing a cheap, blank cheap trick cheap trick and then i'll throw in jeff and jeff. i got a new one for the uh, aerosmith you bastard yeah. I haven't been able to get that. Yeah. So that came in on Monday. For that was the record store day release. First recording ever of them live. I know. I know. They have. I want. I want. Yeah. Um, I'll just add some speculation before I, I do my uh my name. But um <laughs> I speculate that that disc will be reissued in a deluxe of the first Aerosmith album whenever they begin their reissue program that we know is coming. Right. And when I say I speculate, what I actually mean is I hope. Because yeah. <laughs> I want You that know, disc. it probably will, and I'll buy that too. So, Right, because then you'll have it digitally. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I wrote my list on a sticky note that I stuck to the front of Martin Popoff's Rip kills man so that I wouldn't lose my sticky note. And uh, I guess I'll just read them. I, it's really hard to rank them. Okay. 
So I think I'm just going to read them in the order that uh, I wrote them down. So we're going to start with one of my absolute favorites. And uh, this guy truly, truly is a madman. And I'll just get his picture here up on the screen. There we are. I'm sure you recognize that gentleman there as Mike Patton. Yeah. From Faith No More, Mr. Bungle, Phantom Mass. Um, there's so many. But specifically, Faith No More is the one where he replaced um, Chuck Mosley, who replaced a lot of other people, including Courtney Love. Um, so he is about the sixth or seventh Faith No More lead singer. But, I mean, this guy's voice is beyond insane. And he, he, I think he takes his craft really, really seriously. It seems like he's doing bonkers, insane shit, really, to an unschooled ear. But what he's doing is, is composition, just, just very... Hard to explain. Doesn't mean I'd like to necessarily listen to all of his weird shit. But, uh, you know, you can't deny the man's sheer ability. Um, he made Faith No More into a household name. I don't think they would have had a breakthrough without him. He was undoubtedly the focus of that band when he joined. He changed the direction of that band. And um, as far as I'm concerned, I put him in my top three lead singers of all time. So there's some serious praise from me. Yeah. I purposely did not pick him because I figured you would. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah. And you know what, Lana, that is an interesting point. Now they looked a lot goofier in the nineties, but yeah, they're just, they look like just a bunch of average guys. Yeah. Um, Chris Sar is asking John, how long it takes you to write one review. Does that count listening to the album? <laughs> Yes. yes. Uh, you know, it can, I would say one to two hours. Same here. Yeah. yeah. And if I've been, I probably listened to the album five to six times ahead of time, and then I'm listening to it while I'm writing. So if you add it all up, it, it takes a lot of time. Just to share a little personal uh, tidbit. I like to have my review finished, done in a single sitting, you know? Yes. Uh, some, sometimes projects are a little longer. Like, for example, I'm at some point going to tackle that Kiss box set. And I will, depends on how I do it, but I want, I, I'll want to do it in a single day. I want to do that box set in a single day. And it could end up being like three posts, but, you know, that's just my own. I don't like to leave things hanging. <laughs> Have you opened it yet? Oh, yeah. I've listened to the whole thing. So is that version of the acoustic version of Beth, is that the one from Phantom of the Punk? It is not. It sounds like a mix where they took out all the orchestration and mixed in an acoustic guitar very high into the mix. I don't know if that acoustic guitar was always there or what the, what the deal with it is. I, there is, you can hear some acoustic on the original Beth. Am I right? Um, I think at the very tail end of the song, you can definitely hear some acoustic. But um, anyway, that's all it is, Harrison. It seems like a remix to me. Mm. Anyway, uh, Mike Patton, my number five. And that brings us back to uh, you, Captain Predictable. All right. This is a story about a song called Rapid Fire. Mm. So, I was, as you know, I did the Judas Priest Dual Review series. At some point, I got to British Steel. I found it very uninteresting. There was only one song I considered worth listening to, and that was Living After Midnight, which I'd already heard. And then I went on with the series. I shat on Screaming for Vengeance. I found Defenders of the Faith. I found Turbo. I shat on Ram It Down. And eventually, I got to the Ripper era. And I got to 98 Live Meltdown. And song number, I believe, song number, I believe, I'll check what number it is. It's very early on, but it's song five. So it's track five, but it's song four, if you count the Hellion and Electric guy together. But it's rapid fire. And I was listening to it, and I was like, yeah, this is actually pretty good, you know. And, you know, that chorus, you know, sounds great, especially with Ripper behind it so eventually i was just like okay 
what does this song sound like with Halford then? You know, because I've I've started liking it now thanks to Ripper. So I go to this live version from uh, 2009 and I listen to it and I'm waiting for the chorus and then Rob just goes silent. I'm like, oh, he okay, he's just letting the audience sing it. He does that all the time. You know, he 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 doesn't sing the chorus in Electrica. He hasn't done that since 2005. So I go to the studio version and I listen and there's no chorus. And then I'm like, wait a minute, Ripper added this himself. Yeah. The best thing about the song, it wasn't even on the half version. So that, yeah, I was like, yeah, that figures why I uh, why I didn't like it originally, because it needed Ripper behind it, the vocal. And I'm of a very similar opinion for most of the songs on British Steel. They need Ripper on vocals, or I just won't listen to them. Same for Hellbent for Leather. <laughs> and even Electric Eye sounds incomplete with Halford. Now, it still sounds good, but on the Ripper version as it goes from the solo back into the, like, the main riff, I guess. How, uh, Ripper has this perfectly placed scream that just bridges the moment. And now all the Halford versions just sound empty without that, because Halford doesn't do that. So yeah, Tim Ripper Owens as number four entry. I agree. Yeah. I agree with a lot of what you just said. And I also strongly disagree with some of what you just said. Um, Rob Halford's performance on British Steel. Uh, uh, come on, man. The Rage. Whew. I mean, chills up my spine the way Halford sings that song. Don't get me wrong. I like, I might agree with you on Rapid Fire as far as the vocals are concerned. Because he, like, I know what you're talking about. He does that rapid fire, rapid fire. You know, that's what you're talking about, right? That yeah, part. and then when he goes into the second, third verse, I think, he keeps it this high-pitched uh, yeah. tone. Ah, to yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, on this, now, you've also heard his studio version of Rapid Fire? Yeah, but I... Because then he I adds listen. more lines, eh? Yeah. Rapid fire between the eyes! Now that's, you know? now, that's on this version. If that's on. The, I thought that was yeah. only on the single. No, it's on this version, okay. too. And I don't yeah, like it, that. Like, I like that. To, I like that. It, that makes the song for me, that whole chorus back lyrics. and forth. You don't need to add words to Rob's. John, you're just smiling silently. Just well, well, I think you have to. And, you know, that's why I picked him as my number four. But I have heard his studio version. I listened to it once, and then I never listened to it again because there's a live version here that's perfectly serviceable. Well, I, I love that live album. I've been on the record as saying that their live versions on that album, at least of the Ripper material for certain, are superior to the studio versions. Yeah. Wow. I don't uh, have that one yet. John, I recommend it. The box yeah, set has it. The one that... Well, <laughs> I don't uh, have $400 for the box set. Hey, you know what? I won't need two copies when it arrives. Maybe I can gift one to you. Let me wait until I I do a full inventory and uh, yeah. we'll see what happens. But yeah, somebody on this panel tonight is getting that box set, the Judas Priest. How many discs? 52? <laughs> Something like uh, that. 42. 42 disc Judas Priest box set is somebody's getting it under their Christmas tree. And <laughs> geez, 22 days. <laughs> yeah, there's some um, good stuff in that. And the only the only negative thing that I'm gonna say about Ripper Owens is not a critique of the man itself, it's a critique of his what his story inspired, which is a piece of shit <laughs> movie called Rockstar, starring Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. But and Jeff Scott Soto does vocals. Oh my God, you're right. Him and um, the dude from Steelheart. Yeah, uh, shared. I can't pronounce his name, but yes, Mike Madjevic. I think is how it's spelled. But uh, is this six degrees of Soto now? It is. Yes, let's it is. let's try to maintain that. Maybe we'll get to an Ingve singer, and because uh, Jeff Scott Soto, of course, was Ripper was with Ingve. Ripper did a couple albums with Ingve. Yeah, yeah Ripper Soto. Yeah, Ripper's done things with Blaze, with uh, Jeff Tate, with Nico McBrain even. Ripper's done being around the place. I Earth. Okay, well, let's try to keep... Yes, I Earth, that's correct. Uh, let's uh, try to keep the Soto thing in mind and see if we can tie everything back to Soto <laughs> in some way. <laughs> okay, John, what's your number four? My number four. This gentleman won the 2009 Swedish Idol. Ooh. He joined this band on their third album replacing their lead singer where is his name kenny lecromo i uh, probably butch butchered that and the band is from sweden and it's heat oh they're um hard rock 
modern, you know, glam rock kind of band, but the name is Eric Gromwell. He did four albums with them. His, the last album they, he did was called Heat 2, which it was their fifth or sixth album. Um, was my album of the year a couple of years ago. Uh, just phenomenal singer, can scream, can, you know, very melodic at the same time. Just a great voice. Uh, so he is my choice and my number four uh, singer. I don't have any props for that one, so... Well, Sorry. how do you spell his name? I'll get him up on the screen. Eric, E-R-I-K, and Grom, Gronwell, G-R-O-N, well. Oh, there he is, I guess. Yeah, he had to leave the I band. Was assuming. One, he left one the moment. band for medical reasons, and the lead, the original lead singer came back in the band. Okay. You'll tell me in a moment if I've got the right uh, the right guy. I would say it's the blonde guy, but he's from Sweden, so it's all blonde. Yep. <laughs> That's him. Eric Eric Gronwell. There you go. Yep. And good evening, sir. Contrary and Cabbage Cot. Mr. Dreyfus. Yes. Good evening. I, I'm hoping that maybe I can squeeze, you know, twist T-Bone's arm a little bit into making a John T. Snow theme song. Like cue ball, Ladano. There you go. Well, they were calling me Stone Cold earlier. I think maybe Stone Cold might be. Uh, I prefer that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I have nothing to add. Well, to that's you. got um, that movie has um, what's his name, Lance Henriksen in it. In, I believe not. Rock maybe it's a different. No, no, it's it's Stone Cold. He's Stone Cold Steve Austin. Maybe it's a different one. You think? Never mind. I what just like Lance it? Henriksen. I like Lance Henriksen too, but I actually had no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, here's my uh, next pick. I see Harrison has no idea who it is. No, John, I, I, John, John Karabi. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I thought I'm used to the gray hair now, so I, I couldn't. I knew he'd show up on one of the lists. Yeah. <laughs> well, man, I'm stone cold. That's what, what, what can I tell you? I'm stone cold. Um, you know what? This guy gets shit on too much, I think. He does. Um, I saw that he was upset with the way he was portrayed in the, the Motley Crue movie. Uh, I haven't seen the Motley Crue movie, so I don't know. But he said he's only in it for about 20 seconds. Yeah, yeah. They completely glossed over it. It was just like, yeah, we had this other singer. Our next scene, yeah, it was bad. I, I hear a lot of people saying, well, you know, if he was any good, they would have stayed big. No, no. Uh, yeah. Even if Vince Neil was still in the band in 1994, they would not have been big. Uh, very few rock bands were big in 1994. <laughs> bon Jovi somehow... Uh, you know, avoided any kind of grunge backlash. So did Aerosmith. But every other band, seriously, every other band suffered from the grunge backlash. I, oh. uh, funny anecdote. On my way home tonight, I was listening to uh, Twisted Sister, uh, the live in Las Vegas one with Mike Portnoy. And uh, Dee Snyder says, you know, you know, and then grunge happened. The fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. You know, like nobody saw that coming. And, you know, bands like Motley Crue, I think I think they could have been bigger than ever if the climate was right. That was a great album that they did with Karabi. Yeah. Um one of my favorites. If 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 the musical climate had been different, they could have spun off four to five singles from that album. Um I don't know if it would have outsold Dr. Feelgood, probably not, but probably not. At the same time, they would have had a hit with Misunderstood. Absolutely would have had a hit with Misunderstood. Glenn Hughes on backing vocals, another replacement singer. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> He's referring to his own to band. To his own band. <laughs> they went from playing to 10 people to 20. Well, good for you, man. Uh, and the salad bar, you know, I, I wouldn't wouldn't turn down a salad bar myself. Um, anyway, Karabi. And then he ended up replacing... Uh, he was replacing the dude, the original singer in Dead Daisies. Yep. So he's a replacement singer there. Um, replacement guitar player in Rat, which is a whole other category. It always struck me as a waste that they never got him to sing lead. But um, yeah, that's my uh, my number four, the very underappreciated John Karabi. If you guys have any comments, have at it. No, I, mean, I left him off again thinking someone might pick him. Look at this. I, I love the way we're totally in sync. <laughs> There's certain singers I left off because I thought Captain Predictable would 
I predicted Captain Predictable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Anna Harrison. And the three. reason the oh. reason for this name comes from the fact that Lana has basically named three of my entries already. Not that uh, two of them were hard to guess. I told her I expected you to pick one of those three, so that's why one of those three she was on to you about. And um, I believe Ray Gillen was the only one that I haven't mentioned between the last show and now. So, yeah, anyway, let's get to it. Number three, you know, this is probably treasonous given my country of origin, but <laughs> my, uh, my favorite uh, singer in ACDC is one Axel Rose. Oof. <laughs> he just, he absolutely nails the Brian Johnson stuff at a time where Brian Johnson was like underpowered and hoarse and, you know, sounded like he was almost ready to pack it in, you know. Axl Rose comes along and just belts out every one of these classic songs as good as they were recorded in the studio. And the funniest part about that is that, you know, when he was, was singing with Guns N' Roses, like in the previous years and stuff, he had this Mickey Mouse voice. So, you know, you wouldn't expect him to come into ACDC and absolutely belt out with, you know, like almost like in the classic days for him. But he did it, you know, songs like Thunderstruck, Back in Black, Shoot the Thrill, all these Brian Johnson era classics, you know. These are some of my favorite versions of these songs. And he does a good job at the um, at the Bon Scott versions as well. You know, even if he sounds a bit more Mickey Mouse there. I uh, I like Axel. I, I uh, now now here's the thing, yes I I want Brian Johnson to be the lead singer of ACDC. Yeah, I think he did. Um, also, I I want ACDC to sound great live, and I don't think they were going to be capable of performing live with Brian Johnson at that time. And everything changed because of his hearing. Axel did a fucking great job. <laughs> I know you go to the comment section of any YouTube video and it's like filled with people saying, I ne I didn't believe Axel would be as good as he was. You know? Yeah. Just like I, person I after agree. person. You know? To me personally, this is just me, me talking. I don't have any insight to this, but I think when Axel joined ACDC, it completely changed his temperament in so far as showing up on time to gigs. I don't think Axel has been late to a gig since joining ACDC. Those guys don't put up with any BS. And frankly, Axel wouldn't have survived in ACDC if he showed up two hours late every night. Wouldn't they? They wouldn't have. They would have figured out something else. Um, so I, I think ACDC had a lot to do with Axel. You know, and and we have now the the whole Guns N' Roses reunion thing to to be grateful for too. And I think honestly, it started with ACDC, truthfully. Yeah, um, I'm sure Axel was very careful to make sure he turned up uh, on time because I'm sure the ACDC boys had a uh, Jeff Scott Soto on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he could have pulled off that, but yeah. Maybe not that, but uh, there are other singers who could do that that style of singing. I kind of, I would have liked an album. I would have liked know. a live album. I'd like yeah, a live that, album. Maybe that will come. Right. It wasn't a great time for ACDC. Phil Rudd was under house arrest and Malcolm, unfortunately, yes. And uh, yeah, Brian Johnson had a hearing loss. And at some point they figured out the technology to be able to have him perform again. So that's why Brian is back. And Phil, whatever whatever the fuck was going on with Phil, he's, he's over it now. I heard things about methamphetamines and God knows what. Um, in regards to this earlier comment, last week I took the week off because if you saw the 1981 show from the week before, we worked our tails off for that show. And so I took last week off. And, <laughs> dude, you don't want to know what I think about Nickelback. I think they are utter... What do you call that? What do you, what do you say in England? Is it uh, the rubbish? Is that the word Shite. they use in England? Shite? Uh, no. The... I'll tell you why. It all comes down to one song. You look so much cuter with something in your mouth. I That's the dumbest lyric ever written. And uh, they can suck my wang. <laughs> you know what? Lana is, is we value her opinion on everything. Uh, we really do. But she also told me she didn't, doesn't like Bon Scott. So. <laughs> uh, bon Scott's my least favorite of the three. Hey, there's a. I, I forgot this one. 
David Gilmore, you don't think of him as a replacement singer, but it, technically he is, right? Yeah. One of my honorable mentions is one of those where you don't think of him as a replacement singer, but they totally are. Well, I'm going to oh. add David Gilmore to that list of honorables because that's, um, yeah, interesting case there. Anyway, let's uh, move on to uh, John T. Dreyfus and your number three. My number three, the singer of this band, they're... The first album CD I ever bought was theirs. What? Um, the old singer sang this song. He named David. I always have to write this crap down. David Bickler, and he sang this song called "Eye of the Tiger." Ah. And his replacement in Survivor was Jimmy Jameson. This was the album right. Vital Signs, and I think Jimmy's right there. Okay, we're going to do zoom in here. Yep, that's, uh, there yep. he is. So, and he has since passed, sadly. Yeah. Um, but man, he took Survivor in a different direction. You know, they did have some rock hits with Burning Heart as well. But they did a lot of ballads, but he could, I mean, just such a smooth, beautiful voice. Uh, kind of a Steve Perry type, high pitched vocals and stuff. Um, but yeah, that was the first CD I ever bought back in like 1985 or something. And um, it was like 16 bucks. <laughs> they were expensive back then. <laughs> and when you only made five or six bucks an hour, it, it was, you know, a few hours worth of pay for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's always been one of my favorite singers, period. Um, so I had to put him on my replacement singer list because he does have the mention the honorable mention of the first CD I ever bought. So. Happiness agrees with your pick. Survivor's great I workout music. You know what? Life. This is something I'll never find out because you will never find me on a treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> as, as is obvious. <laughs> great pick, John. When did he pass? When did he pass? Oh, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's had to be 10 years. Really? That long? I thought it was more recent, but damn time flies. Well, uh, yeah, we can pull it up. Let's pull it up. Mm. 2014. Damn. So it wasn't 10, but yeah. 63 years old. Yeah. Ooh, there's a good pick. Joey Belladonna. And dude, uh, if you want to rewind to the very beginning of the show, Mike Patton was my very first pick. And uh, Van Halen, we kind of decided earlier in the ground rules, uh, there are certain singers that we consider above. They don't need mentioning. And Sammy Hagar, Bruce Dickinson, Ian Gillen, Ronnie James Dio, these are some of those singers that really, they don't need to be mentioned. So we're going to go a level deeper than that tonight. Uh, but check out the beginning of the show because we did discuss Mike Patton in a bit of detail. All right. I guess that makes it my turn with my number three. A guy that John, I don't think particularly cares for. But let's find out what John thinks. <laughs> Thoughts? I'm trying to even see who it is. Oh, yeah. it's uh, Lawrence Gowan. Oh, I don't have a problem with Lawrence. I just don't like him with sticks. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the, the band that he's the replacement singer. <laughs> I'm grateful that Sticks brought Canadian... Pro, uh, prodigy Lawrence Gowan to uh, international attention. Um, they've put his solo hit Strange uh, Criminal Mind, sorry, not Strange Animal. They've put Criminal Mind in their set and they play it every night. Now everybody in the world knows that song. It's fantastic. Yeah. I I, uh, I think they also played Strange Animal when he first joined, but I'm not, don't quote me on that. I'd love to find a bootleg of Sticks performing Strange Animal. Ah, that's not go there uh <laughs> anyway uh i think that sticks did two of their very best albums with larry gowan i know john and i don't agree on that so much i think crash of the crown is fantastic mm -hmm. um and i really really loved mission to mars i do I mean, like mission to mars concept albums about mars i mean that's just I mean, my bread and butter um <laughs> i've always found i've always thought that gowan is very similar to Steve Hogarth from Marillion. They kind of have a similar timber to their voice. They both play keyboards as their primary instrument. Um, and they both kind of occupy that sort of 
pop rock progressive niche. So um, for those who aren't really familiar with Gowan, uh, that's that's who I would compare him to. Uh, Steve Hogarth from Marillion. And uh, Gowan has done a set of awesome solo albums. Um, he's legendary up here. And uh, uh, you know what? I don't know if we're going to get to... We'll, we'll have to see, man. <laughs> anyway, Larry Gowan, my number three. Uh, he changed his name to Lawrence Gowan at one point. And, uh, he called his album, Don't Call Me Larry. <laughs> I think so. I fucking have that wrong. I'm sure I have that wrong. But anyway, let's just move on. Harrison, you yes. are taking us into the top two. Yeah, this... Uh, we'll get to Rainbow in the honorable mentions. We'll get here too. But um, 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 um what was I going to say? Oh yes, this is the most curveball pick I've possibly ever picked on a list. It might get me slightly disqualified. But I remember when I first made this list, I made sure to check the. It says top five replacement singers. It doesn't specify anywhere that they have to be lead singers. Oh, I see. You you oh. do have a point there in the in the technicalities. So I've picked a replacement bass player who also did replacement backing vocals for good. live. Good, good, good. So, Electric Light Orchestra on the studio renditions of the songs before this person joined. Jeff Lynne would sing lead vocals and he'd sing harmony backing vocals, but he couldn't do that live. So the bass player at the time was a fellow by the name of Mike de Albuquerque. And he had, I love his glass. He, he had these really cool glasses and hair and stuff. He had this, you know, good sense of fashion, but his voice was quite possibly one of the raspiest, most coarse voices I've ever heard. And, you know, this is Electric Light Orchestra. They're known for sweeping vocal harmony. So this guy, bless him, but he just was not the right voice for ELO by a long shot. There, are, There's a, um, my ELO Blu-ray has a show with him on it. So there are some songs which he does, you know, his voice does actually improve them, I think, one or two. But then there are some where he's trying to sing the bridge for Roll Over Beethoven, and it's just unfortunately comically hoarse and raspy. <laughs> and so, but he left the band after, during the recording of 1974's El Dorado, and he left because touring was keeping him away from his family for too long at a time. And his replacement was a fellow by the name of Kelly Grucup. Now, Kelly Grucup was the complete opposite to um, to Mike de Albuquerque because Kelly's backing vocals and singing voice was this incredibly silky wing one, which perfectly complemented Jeff Lynne. And it was at this point that ELO was basically complete in the sense of the classic lineup. They had um, Kelly Grucup on backing vocals and he was able to do the, the songs justice when singing backing vocals. And his vocals were so good, basically, just so well suited for the band that as time went on, he would actually take over more and more lead vocal duties from Jeff Lynne as well yes. he'd sing sometimes he'd sing whole songs lead vocals and just jeff would do the backing vocals and you know he sounds great you know he's he's a competent enough singer at elo to he could have fronted the band himself and nobody would have batted an eyelid and um he got to sing more elo songs when he was in elo part two after the band ended, but that's a long story and the last thing oh yes he um for those of you that's heard, that have heard the song Rocaria, it opens with this like sort of like brief opera singing bit done by an opera singer, but live Kelly would actually do that himself and he'd do it, you know, the proper justice. But unfortunately, as I mentioned last show, he would leave after the time tour in 1981. He was not invited back after suing the band for unpaid royalties. Oh, yeah, that yeah. does... Yeah. That does... But, Put a, put a damper on any yeah. hopes for... <laughs> and, yeah, Jeff Lynne was a bit of a Steve Harris, so, you know, it was it was his band and, yeah. you know, what yeah. he said goes. But it didn't matter as much in that regard as the band never toured after the time tour. So it's not, at least in that first incarnation, so it's not like his backing vocals were missed on the live stage. Yeah, I, have, I have absolutely nothing to add because this is all completely new to me. So <laughs> thank you for your... Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and thanks for going off the beaten track there and not being predictable. That was awesome. Thanks, man. No, that was good. 
I'd like to address our friend Happiness here. Patience, young Luke. Patience. <laughs> <laughs> and um paul you know i i liked paul rogers with queen um i don't know what you mean by queen didn't deserve him i mean why um and queen fans were very ungracious and i do agree with that maybe the yeah. queen fans didn't deserve him but the band sure did i think uh so i'm a booster for paul rogers with queen I, uh, thoughts gentlemen I yeah i don't think i've heard anything i didn't really oh. listen to it I did like Adam when Adam came on, so I don't yeah, mind Adam. All right. uh, you know, Adam I've seen does him a live, good... and I know what he can do now. And Adam live, does a good "Don't Stop Me Now." They're an impressive band live. These two points here, James Hetfield. Yes, he mm -hmm. would count as a replacement singer. Yeah. yeah, and actually, yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. you might even you might <laughs> even see this guy on a list later. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, John, it's your number two. All right, I'm not sure this one counts, but we're going to see. Um, there's this band from the 90s, very angry, did a lot of protest music. Uh, the lead singer was Zach De La Roca. Is that how you say it? Yeah. He quit, so they needed to find a replacement. So they interviewed a bunch of people, and they decided on this gentleman by the name of Chris Cornell, and then they changed the name of the band to Audio Slave. So he is my pick for the number two, Chris Cornell. Because even though they changed the name of the band, it was still Rage Against the Machine. They just changed the name of the band because they got a new lead singer, just like Van Halen should have done. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's really funny, John? Yeah. Lana and I have been talking about this back and forth, and she's been asking me who qualifies, who does, who's not. And she asked me if Chris Cornell counted. I said, nope. He counted? I said, nope. But as you know, we run a no disqualification show here, so I can that's I can valid. do a replacement. No, no, I no, no, I, I got another one. Oh, John, no, no, I yeah, won't. I, will, I, I have it on here somewhere. Your... Oh shoot, I can't find it. Oh yes, by I'll, I'll go then with Scott Whelan with Velvet Revolver since they were Guns and Roses and then it became Velvet Revolver. But no, that one doesn't count. But Chris Cornell is definitely my number one, my number I'm wondering two. wondering which one he thinks of us is really funny. I really have no idea. <laughs> anyway, um, that is a great pick. Um, both of them. You know, I, I, I thought about Chris Cornell in Audio Slave, and you're, you're totally right. But um, for me, I just, I... I I really like the way those two styles melded. Yes. Like when you think about it, Rage Against the Machine and Chris Cornell, they sh in theory it shouldn't have worked, and it did. Like honestly, that I've reviewed the first album; it's a five out of five. And yeah, that's a, that's that's a good point there. But that first that first Audio Slave album that's a five out of five. Absolutely, yeah. it's so it's good. Solid. And they still play all those tunes on the radio. Yeah, yeah, and the, the reason I thought of him is I did Google like top replacement singers and he came up on a ton of lists because in the story of rage against the machine, they said it was still rage. Right. And they hired him. And I guess once they started playing, they realized it was a different sound. So they ended up changing the name. I wonder what would have happened if they didn't change the name. Yeah. That'd have been different. Yeah. I don't have anything live of theirs, but I, how much rage did they play live? If any, I don't know. I don't have anything live from them. It's like that's such a hard style to perform if you're not Zach De La Rocha, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. I'd sound like a total jackass going like B -b bomb track, you know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm going to get to my number two. And again, these aren't in any particular order. And, you know, this guy probably, I doubt you guys have, have picked him. And I doubt you'll recognize uh -huh. him. But that gentleman's name is Zach Stevens. And he was the replacement for John Oliva in Sabotage. A band that we talked about earlier tonight in regards to Ray Gillen. Um, when John Oliva left Sabotage, he actually didn't really leave Sabotage. <laughs> he still wrote all the songs. 
and basically produced the band and coached the singer, handpicked the new lead singer and coached him. So it was more like a sort of like a passing of the torch. And then John Oliva basically just uh, did live keyboards for most of the uh, for most of the set. But when they got Zach Stevens in, he was a very different kind of singer. John Oliva is more of a screamer. But uh, Stevens, they kind of compared him to Jeff Tate at the time. He had that more kind of smoothness to his voice. And his voice got rougher as the years went on, but just added more character to me. Um, He completely changed the sound of the band, uh, commercialized it, which was not a bad thing in my opinion. Uh, I think they should have been a lot bigger. I think the song, the song "Edge of Thorns" could have been big in a, in another time in another place. Um, yeah, I think this guy is is underappreciated, and uh, James Durbin is also a, a, uh, a Quiet Rider, another band with a lot of lead singers. I disagree with that one. <laughs> yeah, I know you don't like Durbin. I like Quiet, Durbin in, in Quiet Riot. In, in Quiet, Quiet Riot. Riot. But uh, anyway, I don't know if you guys have anything to add about Zach Stevens. I think he's a, a great singer. His uh, solo band, Circle to Circle, was also, it was like Sabotage Part 2. And uh, that's my pick. Yep. Zach Good Stevens. One. I don't know enough about him, but I do know, I mean, I heard that stuff with him. So, Have you heard that song, Edge of Thorns? I, I've heard albums. I couldn't tell you songs, so I haven't listened to them enough. But uh, I've tried their albums out. And uh, so, but I don't, I don't know much enough about them to really speak to it. Fair enough. Harrison, any thoughts? Um, not really. The only sabotage I've heard, as I mentioned, was that bootleg with Ray Gillen and a couple minutes of in the Hall of the Mount or Hall of the Mountain King to see if it was a cover of the classical tune, which is not. <laughs> well, um, actually, on the album, they do an extended intro, and yes, the classical okay. tune is a part of it nice. uh, but yeah when they play it live they just go straight into the riff and usually when they put it on compilations and whatnot they cut out that that intro but the classical tune is such a monster of a riff as well this could be a good point too who knows yeah well i guess we're going into the number one position um quick show tonight pacing is Something I'm still learning with the Cinco de Listo, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I'm just delaying, basically, at this mm-hmm. point. Does anybody want to want to? Do you have well, anything? You, you, you mentioned Quiet Riot build, with James, some, yes, with yes, James yes, Durbin sure. earlier. Hmm. Well, they had that one album with the cool cover art. Which album are you referring to? Uh, the one with the Mad Max truck on it. Basically. Oh, Road Rage. Yeah. 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 That um, had cool cover art. It did. It did have cool cover art. That I know, John and I don't agree on the Road Rage album. <laughs> no, I quite like that. Actually, it's not me. Bear did not agree with it because Bear did a one a zero <laughs> word review, and I took a picture of Bear taking a dump in the backyard, and that was his review of the album. <laughs> Blame it on the dog. <laughs> not the first time a dump has been used as a zero word review not the first time a dump has been used as a zero word review for a quiet riot album Quiet Riot three yeah they had their first uh replacement lead singer would have been uh oh god what's his name paul shortino from rough cut came in on the quiet riot the fourth album well not the fourth album actually the sixth album it's hard to keep all that straight um Kevin Dubrow came back when he passed away. I believe they they immediately replaced him with um, God. What was that guy's name? It was just a it was just a roller coaster. Elite singers for them. And Jizzy Pearl's been in the band twice. He's already recorded an album with Quiet Riot. He did Quiet Riot ten, which I think was their twelfth. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know. It gets so confusing with those guys. Anyway, well, it depends but, who you ask. Right, if you ask on Wikipedia or or the Brain site. Let's let's not go there because <laughs> Quiet Riot's management wasn't happy with me at that time. That was that was pre pre LeBrain Train era, and uh, well, we'll tell the story real quick. Real quick, it was yeah. uh, when Frankie Benelli decided to reform Quiet Riot without Kevin Dubrow. Somebody started going on all the Quiet Riot pages and re-editing them to make it sound like. Um, Frankie Benelli was the original drummer, 
which I'm sorry, he, he wasn't. Uh, Drew Forsythe Drew Forsyth was the drummer on the first two Quiet Riot albums. Their argument was that that was a different band, also called Quiet Riot, and also with Kevin Dubrow on lead vocals, and also performing Thunderbird, and also with the same logo on some of the albums. They were arguing that it was a different band, and that Metal Health was the debut Quiet Riot album. Now, I... I Management knows the history of the band better than anybody else, but Wikipedia is a fact-based, you know, you have to have backup for everything that you edit if it gets challenged. A lot of stuff obviously goes unchallenged on Wikipedia, and that's why it's not considered a valid source. But things that are sourced with footnotes on Wikipedia, you can go to the footnote and you can verify the, the information. And there's no way, there's no interview or anything like that with Kevin Dubrow out there stating that there's two bands called Quiet Riot, that he started one with Randy Rhodes in the 70s, and then he started another one with Frankie Benali in 1982 or 83. There's no source that states that. So management lost that argument with Wikipedia. Hmm. And I was one of the people arguing on the behalf of Quiet Riot being one single band. And uh, that did not endear me to Quiet Riot's management. <laughs> And uh, the less Definitely said about that, won't be appearing in the liner notes of any upcoming. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if management still remembers my name or not, but uh, I doubt it because when when Frankie was sick, I donated some money to his cancer fund, and I got an email back from management saying, you know, thank you for. I'm sure it was a form letter, an automatic email, but regardless, I don't think management recognized my name. So they've forgotten about me, hopefully. <laughs> anyway, we've delayed long enough. Let's go ahead with our number one picks. Harrison, I have a feeling I can predict yours. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, what's the... Oh, gee, I wonder who it could be. Uh, mm. oh, his name rhymes with Schmaze Schmaley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Um, oh, Ace hmm. Fraley? Oh, cool. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> <laughs> no. This is, duh, Blaze Bailey, you know, yeah. anyone could have seen this coming. Yeah. You know, uh, not only do I just love his voice, but I, you know, the X Factor and Virtual Eleven, these albums needed Blaze on vocals, mm -hmm. partly because they needed his voice mm -hmm. and partly because Iron Maiden would have had a downward spiral if they'd kept Bruce. And Iron Maiden fans needed to see, unfortunately, that Blaze was a necessary evil to remind them that what they had and that they shouldn't be grateful for just having Bruce in the band, you know. But on the more positive side, I love Blaze's music with Maiden. I like both those albums. I love him live. I think he did a lot of songs, you know. At, I wouldn't say he did him consistently as well as Bruce, but I can find renditions of just about every song he performed live that he would did as well as Bruce at one point, in my opinion. I know LeBrain heartily disagrees, but um, you know, it's my entry, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, all's fair. Yeah, the one that most people go to is the version of "Afraid to Shoot Strangers" recorded live in Gothenburg, nineteen ninety-five, that appeared on "Best of the Beast." the uh, two CD version, as well as the, um, I believe it was the B side to one of the virtual 11 singles as well. That's a great version. Um, but Blaze's time in Maiden did more than just help Maiden out. It helped, it helped him survive. It helped Blaze out too. It launched his solo career and it taught him a lot. You know, there's a lot of things like guitar harmonies are uh, very often find their way into Blaze's work. You know, and I attribute that to his time in Maiden, despite the fact that they made a conscious effort to not do any guitar harmonies on the X Factor. But yeah, I love Blaze's solo career. So his time in Maiden, yeah, I love that as well. Not too fond of Wolfsbane, though. Yeah, I, I, I know Scott Carson, heavy metal, heavy metal overlord, is a, is a Wolfsbane guy, but I'm not. Well, I mean, my reviews are up. So <laughs> Lana has a question for you. Harrison, would you still like Maiden if Blaze was still in the band? Keep in mind, Book of Souls is one of your favorite Maiden albums. Hmm. Interesting question. Um, put it this way. I think that 
like I said, Blaze was a necessary evil. I like his solo career a lot too. And that started 2001. So I'm just going to say that Brave New World needed Bruce on vocals, like the X Factor and Virtual Eleven needed Blaze on vocals. Okay. I like th I'm perfectly happy with how things turned out. You get two great bands worth of material instead of just one. I agree. Because I'm not the biggest on Bruce's solo career. Uh, okay, I'm going to have an issue with you there. But <laughs> <laughs> John, any thoughts? You know, I'm not an Iron Maiden fan, so I know you're not. Yeah. And it's not, <laughs> not, and it's actually not a you know, me not being a fan is not that I hate them. Yeah, I've just never really mm -hmm. listened to them, so I have nothing against them. I loved growing up in the '80s, you know, Run to the Hills, Fly to Icarus, all that, but I just never got into the albums and never bought any. And so, as yeah, I someday always I need say, to do that. as I always mm -hmm. say, wait until they reissue them in deluxe editions before you. I buy. hope that happens. It, yeah, it right now, damn well just, happen. Yeah, right now it'd just be so expensive to go back and start buying their stuff. But you know what's funny, Harrison? Deluxe editions of Maiden. I don't think that they really do demos, so there might not no. be a lot of extra material for them. That's to why you get the live stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, this is all speculation. And the B sides, of course. You know, there are some that haven't appeared on Best of the B sides, and Best of the right. B sides is right. a pain in the ass to find these days. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I will add one thing to your blaze. You said he had to be on the X Factor and Virtual Eleven, which is true. I can tell you this from my own experience playing Maiden in the store. I could get away with those two albums because they had a darker tone. I played Best of the Beast one time, and as you know, it starts off with those blaze tunes. Hmm. But then Bruce start, when 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 a when a Bruce st song started, there were kids in the store. They were laughing. They're they're like listen. <laughs> Listen to the high voice guy. They thought it was funny. So that just goes to show you that it was a different time. And yes, they needed Blaze at that time to be commercially viable. Uh, with Bruce, there would have been kids in record stores laughing at his singing. That's a fact. And I can tell Blaze you. Blaze with Maiden were as big as they ever were in South America. In, even in Europe, they were, still did pretty well with Blaze. It was just a ye olde fickle North America that... Uh, Kicked no, them out. no, and England, maybe North America, with the exception of Quebec, the province Sorry, of Quebec. <laughs> uh, Iron Maiden went top top ten in Quebec, and uh, there was a joke that I read in, and, and this is only only Canadians will get this joke, but uh, the joke is that Iron Maiden going top ten only in Quebec proves that they are indeed a distinct society. That was a, <laughs> that that remind, was a, yeah. Well, uh, you know, maybe I'll move to Quebec, but um, uh, that they, right, they have the. They have the best Putin. <laughs> yeah, but I was having a conversation with one of my uni classmates with a bunch of them. And for some reason, we were trying to find what's the most racist part of Canada. Oh, I can tell I you, know. Alberta. Yeah, we, we came to the conclusion, Quebec. No. So, no. Um, but you are, of course, Canadian. So that solves Quebec that. is the, okay. You know what? I, I, I'm obviously delaying here. Sorry, I've got this off <laughs> but, topic. Uh, uh, Quebec is the province that banned uh, certain kind of face coverings so that Muslim women, it, was, it would be illegal for them to cover cover their whole face. So Quebec did that. But Alberta is known as sort of like the cowboy redneck mini Trump province of Canada. And currently in Canada, there's a crisis between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And there's a lot of unvaccinated in Alberta. It's just that kind of province. We build a wall. <laughs> no, we build a wall around Alberta. Hey, yes, you're better off in Australia. And oh, yeah, yes, damn right. We've been COVID free for ages. Well, uh, not really. Yes, I, I just saw on the news. That well, sorry. One of the Omicron cases. West there. Australia, where okay. I live, has been COVID free for like <laughs> ages. It's 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 yeah. It turns out being the most isolated city in the world has its advantages. Yeah. Good, good. <laughs> stay, stay isolated. As for me, I'm going to kind of bunker down for the winter. <sighs> anyway, that's enough delaying there. John, tell us your number one replacement singer of all time. My number one replacement singer of all time. It's once you hear it, it'll be obvious. Oh, hang on. Oh. That comes from my mom and authority. <laughs> she is older than you. Oh, Harrison Cop! 
no more experience. Right. More experienced. Yes, there you go. <laughs> By the way, Why this was this cup. There was just some coffee grounds at the bottom of it. It's disgusting. Now I gotta I'm gonna wash it down with something I've never had before. San Pellegrino Clementine soda. No. Never heard of that one. <laughs> Neither have I. Anyway, go ahead, John. Okay. Um yeah, when I show this, everybody well, you'll you'll definitely know who I'm talking about. But it's ah. Danger Danger. Yes, sir. He did a bunch of albums with Danger Danger. I've got them all. <laughs> he was the second singer mm -hmm. in the band after Ted replacing Poli. Ted Poley. Yep. It is Paul Lane. <laughs> Our friend. Oh, obvious choice, I know, since we already know I'm a huge fan. We did the interview with him. and um, But yeah, I mean, I, I knew his solo album before that, and then when I heard he was in Danger Danger, I really got into Danger Danger at that point. So I already liked Danger Danger, but with him, for me, it took it to another level. I ended up buying everything that they had and and stuff. So I just, I love his singing. He's a great rock singer, great with ballads, great with the screamers kind. I mean, he can do it all. And yeah, so I've been a fan for quite a while with it, since the beginning, I guess, with him. So I can luckily say I knew him as a solo artist, but now he's my favorite replacement singer too. So, uh, Obvious choice, but yes, and a Had good person go from what we've what we've personally experienced with him. A good person too, just an awesome guy. Yeah, and, and I've really, been meaning to check in with him. Yeah, to see yeah, if he's yeah. At a point where he can talk the Defiance new album and the Netflix project he has going. Oh, well, we know he's um, recording, and so hopefully we can do that soon, and uh, like maybe in January or something, and get him to do his top five '80s albums is what we're hoping for. So. Speaking of January and interviews and Six Degrees of Soto, I think now's as good a time as ever, Mr. Snow, if you'd like to update us. Do we want to, do we want to, do we want to spill the beans? No, it's there's, still no, beans early. To, still there's early. no beans to spill right now. <laughs> okay, there's no beans True. to spill. Let's, Nothing we, confirmed. Are, okay, so here's, here's what we can Sorry, say. Sorry, I jumped the gun there. You jumped the gun. Here, here's what we can say. This yes. is what we can say. Yesterday, John announced that he's doing his 60 plus album Jeff Scott Soto uh, review project, which we showed you the photo earlier. Well, he posted that photo on Instagram. Yep. That photo was then shared by Bumblefoot, the lead guitar player, former lead guitar player of Guns N' Roses and also Son lead guitar player of Sons of Apollo. Right. Which Jeff was a part of. And Jeff Scott Soto saw that photo. And Jeff Scott Soto said some very, very kind words about John's collection. That's, said, that's what we can tell you at this point. Yeah. He said, let's do that interview ASAP. And we're now in negotiation trying to figure out when we can do it. There you go. So, yeah. I don't know if it's going to happen, but we will see. But how cool is that? That that Soto saw that photo. I mean, I he hate rhyming Soto with photo. But... <laughs> yeah. He reposted it and talked about it. And because um, he said the last collection he saw of that size, someone had brought it to him and he ended up signing everyone. <laughs> it took hours. In it, and it took him two hours to do RSI. it. RSI. He did post that picture today. He had found it and reposted that picture. So, um, yeah, we will see. Um, fingers crossed. There was a, a, again, I'll say it. That's a fantastic photo. Yeah. That brought up something funny that uh, I, I, I didn't notice it then, but it reminds me of it then, is that a lot of bands don't have complete collections of their own material. Mm -hmm. No, 100%. well, we found that out with Leopard. <laughs> yeah. Not even Max the Axe. Um, Helix, oh, yeah. I've got stuff that Helix doesn't have. Um, yeah, I've got stuff that Max doesn't have too. <laughs> he gave it to me. <laughs> I have the only existing copy of uh, Guns to Iran featuring lead vocals by Max the Axe on this cassette here. That oh, is wow. the cassette bonus track. The CD didn't have Guns to Iran. Now, one of our local record stores, Noble Records, uh, Dylan bought this massive metal collection. And in it was an original vinyl of Motley Crue's debut album on Leather Records. Yeah. So Dylan's promise to the locals is anything he gets, he puts it on sale in the store for one week before he puts it up online. That's cool. Nikki Six called the store because they saw his post that he had this album. And Nikki Six does not have that album on vinyl. 
on the leather Rutgers label and wanted to buy it from Dylan. Dylan said no, because he had to wait a week. He said, I will wait a week. If I don't sell it, I'll call you back or whatever. He ended up selling it for $400 to a local guy. Wow. So, yeah. But it That's was a, a crazy story. Yeah. Well, he's sweet. not appearing in the line it. of notes. I held it crew. and looked at the price and stuck it right back up on the counter. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm not going to buy this. Uh, incidentally, that was the policy at, at our record store too. All inventory was on the shelf for one week before it was listed online. Yeah, and uh, that used to piss off some customers. I was like, oh, "Where is this on your website? I saw it in the store." And I'm like, "Well, you should have bought it when you saw it in the store, you jackass." <laughs> yeah, why would you not buy it then? I, I, I used to piss me off, but anyway, I guess it's my turn, right? I've been delaying and delaying and delaying. Uh, there he is. Let's get him up on the screen here. I know you guys know who this guy is. There you go. Yeah. Glenn Hughes. Yep. Oh. Um, I'm specifically thinking of him being the replacement singer in Black Sabbath mm -hmm. um, because the Deep Purple situation is a little bit more uh, amb ambiguous. Was he a replacement singer or was he a replacement bassist that just happened to be a, a great singer? He was what? a replacement bassist that was a great singer yeah. and helped out. But he was on, he he sang lead on him some of the studio versions. In yes, my he did. He did. Thing, so. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, anyway, I, I, I love the Seventh Star album that he did with Black Sabbath. Mm, I, I love that album. I think it would have been better received if it was an actual Tony Iommi solo album. I you know, I disagree that it should have been a Tony Iommi solo album. We can get into this when we do the 1986 show, but I like the albums that came under it under the Black Sabbath banner, and I don't know if we would have got them had it been a Tony Iommi album. It's a hard to it's hard to say, Harrison. Um, Not to mention how well Ray Gillen sang the uh, live stuff of Sabbath that we might not have got as many of. But yeah, yeah. we'll we'll tackle that when we do 1986. It's always fun to speculate on these alternate things that could have happened. Yeah, I I, I really want to get see the alternate universe where Tony Martin auditioned for Iron Maiden and got in. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. I don't want to see that at all. Um, Glenn Hughes is also a replacement singer in the Dead Daisies, uh, replacing the guy that was on my list earlier, John Karabi. Yep. Um, so there you go. Uh, Glenn Hughes has sung with a lot of different bands. Um, Black Country Communion being one of my favorites. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, what was the what's California? The, Cal, what, yeah, what, sorry, what's that name? California? California Dream or California... That was an awesome album. I have that album. I don't like it as much as BCC. No. I got to actually get caught up on my BCC. I only have the first two or three albums. Um, but I, I love Glenn Hughes' voice, and I'm really happy that... I mean, he was one of those guys that had disappeared completely off the map at one point, you know. Um, he had a lot of problems with drugs, and uh, then he started to make a, a, a slow but steady comeback. Um, it started kind of with uh, he, he did some guest vocals on a don not sorry not don Dawkin, uh george lynch solo album saying guest vocals on two tracks and it was the first time i heard glenn hughes voice doing lead vocals in ages remember he was on slip of the tongue but you can't hear him you can't hear him on slip of the tongue yeah. um after that he did a solo album called from now on with uh, a couple of the guys from europe and that album was really strong. And then it just built from there. He kept on putting out a solo album after solo album after solo Couple album. live albums. After live albums. And and people were like, holy crap, Glenn Hughes, is, he's, he's still got the voice. He's still got it. And at one point in the in the Sabbath period, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't cut it. He yeah. couldn't cut it. And um, sure, Glenn Hughes counts. Um, so you, you just got to be really happy for the guy. He seems happy himself to be playing. And look how many bands the guy plays in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he seems happy and he seems healthy. And just nothing but positive vibes from Glenn Hughes. So I just, I, I want to salute the guy. I totally just want to salute the guy and um, just say, well done, man. Because you know, it might have turned out very differently. Yeah. So Glenn Hughes is my number one replacement singer. Oh, that's a good one. Thanks, man. Yeah. Because anyway, uh, yeah. um, we'll open it up to uh, some runners up. You guys want to want to have at it? I guess I'll go first because I'm 
next in line. Um, sure. First, I'll start with an interesting anti-replacement uh, where I preferred the person who was replaced. And okay. um, yeah, I'm bringing this up because it's probably uh, very contrarian, but um, <laughs> I'm not big on Journey at all. But I heard Wheels in the Sky studio version, and then I heard the demo. And let's just say I prefer Rob Fleischman on vocals. Wait a second. You've heard a Fleischman demo of Wheels in the Sky? Because I haven't. Yeah, there's, it's on YouTube. Sounds great. I didn't know that. Wow. I'm sure John has the Time 3 box set. I don't. Oh, you don't? Well, there's one Fleischman track on it. And it's a great, great, really good pop rocker tune with a hell of a melody. Um, You know what? Fleischman was on my runners-up list. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, to the actual runners-up. First up. Ah, uh, yeah, it was Poland who I sent to uh, got me that one, basically. Neat. Yeah. Um, first up, Tony Martin, both times. Uh, of course, yes, of course. Ian Gillen, Sabbath and Purple. Glenn Hughes, Sabbath and Purple. Uh, Van Hagar, 100%. You know, as... Uh, I'm going to quote my thoughts on David Lee Roth, uh, and I'm going to quote uh, Tommy Lee Jones when he was talking to Jim Carrey on the set of Batman Forever. He's reported as saying, I cannot sanction your buffoonery. That <laughs> That's right, he did. He did. That's my <laughs> response to David Lee Roth. Um, here, here is the one that uh, most people wouldn't think of as a initially think of as a replacement for singer Paul Deanna. That's right. Because he replaced Dennis Wilcock, who replaced, uh, what's his name, Paul Mario Day. Right. Paul Mario Day technically counts as well, because he replaced, he, was, he sang in the suite in the second incarnation of the band. But although there was a gap between um, those incarnations. And lastly, Bonnet, Lynn Turner and White of the Rainbow Family. Um, add Ronnie Romero to that as well. Oh, Ronnie Romero, concerned. yes. Of uh, course. As replacement singer in both Rainbow and Vandenberg. Yeah. And that's all my runners up. Brilliant. John. Of course. Of course. All right. My runners up. Yeah, I had uh, Coverdale and Hughes for yeah. Deep Purple. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm, I didn't want to put David in my top five because. Too obvious. Uh, too obvious. Yeah. Um, Kevin Cronin, Oreo Speedwagon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He joined them after the first album, did one album, then he left. And then about 1976, he comes back. And then the rest is history. They went through the roof from the end of the seventies and early eighties. So, and he's still with them. And they were in the Ozarks. Did you see the? Do you watch the Ozarks? No. Okay. They had a an episode where they were doing a concert, and it was Ario Speedwagon, and they tried to launder money money through Ario Speedwagon's manager. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's just off the top. Um, uh, Scott Stapp who replaced Scott Whelan in Art of Anarchy. Okay, okay. Which I'm not a huge fan of that Art of Anarchy, but I like Scott Stapp, so I'll admit it. I, I'm a fan. Uh, well, Steve Perry of Journey. Yes. I mean, of course. And Bill again, Collins. that's Robert Fleischman we were just talking about that he replaced. Yep. Uh, Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks. Mm -hmm. for Ooh, Back. yeah. I almost put them in my top five. Oh, I kind of wish love, you did. Love Buckingham. <laughs> yeah. Love Buckingham. Uh, and then Jeff Gutt, Stone Temple Pilots. I knew he would be there somewhere. Yeah. So he gets honor mention. And I just find, I finally got it on vinyl, the, the, his debut with him. And I, it's gonna, I'm going to keep it sealed. Yeah. Because I have the CD. And uh, I figured I needed it for Ryan, my Ryan collection and my <laughs> yes. Stone Temple Pilot mm. collection. So. Right. Yeah. Former LaPrain trained guest Ryan Williams. Yeah, I try to collect anything. Anytime I find a vinyl out in the wild that he worked on and his name's in there somewhere, I buy it. And so the kids can have it. That's cool. So they're on, they go, that's my Uncle Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's, uh, here's the guys that you guys haven't mentioned uh, Trevor Horn, Mark Slaughter, who also oh. replaced Robert Fleischman. Oh my gosh, I should have picked that. <laughs> uh, here's here's a guy that we talked about a few weeks ago with uh, Dan Varga. Uh, Phil Nero, he was a singer out of Buffalo. And he replaced uh, 
Well, he was a replacement singer in Talos. I couldn't tell you the name of the original members that sang. Uh, they were originally a power trio with a singing bassist, uh, sorry, singing guitar player and a singing drummer, I believe. Uh, but then they expanded into a quartet when uh, Billy Sheehan dropped that lineup and started a new one with Phil Nero. Okay. And Phil Nero. That's why I've heard that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mark Tornillo from Accept. He did the impossible and replaced Udo Dirk, Dirk Schneider successfully. That was not something I saw coming. Um, Happiness keeps mentioning Philip Anselmo. And yes, Philip Anselmo is a replacement singer in Pantera. Uh, they did four albums before Cowboys from Hell, and the first three have Terry Glaze, I think. I think the first three. Um, William Duvall in Alice in Chains, replacing Lane Staley. I think that Alice in Chains have managed to carry on in a respectful way. Yeah. Todd Latour in Queensryche. Queensryche. You know, that band was going down the tubes. And um, I know there's a lot of haters out there. And, 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 and un, un, he does, I mean, he, he deserves kudos because yeah. he's really, a fun, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Queensryche in that era, <laughs> but he's so good. He really he is. is. He is. Yeah. Michael Sweet, Boston. Oh, well, that's Brad, right. I forgot. Brad, Brad Delp. I love Boston with Michael Sweet. They, he did a great job. <laughs> he can really sing those Boston tunes. Yeah. Uh, I thought I, of another one. Um, who, I forgot his name. Who replaced whoever the singer was in Foreigner? Uh, Kelly Hansen from Kelly uh, Hurricane. Yeah, he's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was also another Foreigner lead singer. Uh, when Lou Graham left the first time, and I can't remember his name. Bad Company had a number of, of decent replacement singers, too. Uh, Brian Adams. A little band called Sweeney Todd. Brian Adams did an album called If Wishes Were Horses, and he sounds like he's about 15 years old, and maybe he was. Um, Mike Viscara. I was thinking specifically of an album that I have a review coming up of. Ingve J. Malmsteen's The Seventh Sign. Uh, Mike Viscara sang lead vocals on two Ingve Malmsteen albums. But also, he replaced Min Minoru Niihara in Lapnus. I think he's a great singer. Um, who else do I have here? Pepper Keenan from Corrosion of Conformity. Um, tech, he's kind of like, not really a replacement singer in a way, because... Um, when he joined the band, they had a lead singer named Carl Agel or Agel. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but Carl Agel, I'll say. And Pepper Keenan sang lead vocals only on a, a couple of tunes, one of which happened to be a hit called Vote with a Bullet. So when they changed their lineup the following album, Pepper Keenan graduated to full on lead singer. So maybe he qualifies. Strangely enough, he also auditioned to be the bass player of Metallica, replacing Jason Newstead. I thought that would have been awesome because of the way that his voice and James Hetfield's voice, um, they mesh. Uh, Hetfield did background vocals on a uh, corrosion of conformity track. And I just love the way those two guys sing together. They also sang together on Tuesdays gone on the Metallica garage Inc album. And finally, Eric Litwiller <laughs> as lead vocalist of Maxi Axe, replacing a number of singers, including Mickey Strait. Uh, they have never had a better singer than Eric Litwiller, and I dare reckon they are not going to have a better lead singer than Eric Litwiller. He replaced a couple at the same time, didn't he? I think, well, Max, most of his albums before Sonic, uh, sorry, um, uh, Status Electric, have multiple singers. Like it was almost like a project more than a band in a way. But Status Electric is the first one, I think, that has one lead singer through the whole thing. So, yeah, you're right. Um Kudos to Eric Litwiller, who doesn't appear to be watching tonight. But uh, how dare he? We uh, we love you, man. Uh, he's a great singer, truly, honestly, speaking from the heart. And uh, there's my runners up. Well, well, I, I just thought more. of Joey Belladonna. Uh, yeah, yeah. Somebody mentioned him in the comments earlier. Joey oh, Belladonna. Okay. Yeah. Um, John Bush. Nobody mentioned John Bush. Yeah. Um, for in the suite, uh, as I mentioned, Paul Mario Day replaced um, the original singer. Uh, uh, around 1986, Paul Mario Day married the Australian tour manager, and he 
basically came here to live with her. So they got bass player uh, Mal McNulty to step up to lead vocals. Interesting. Hmm. And then Mal McNulty went on to replace Noddy Holder in Slade. Oh, sorry. I had one more that I forgot to write down. Uh, Scotch on the Rocks guest, Mr. Nicholas Walsh, uh, in a band called Moxie. They're sort of a Canadian classic rock band. Uh, Russ Dwarf from Killer Dwarfs has also done lead vocals in Moxie, but we'll give Nick Walsh a shout out there as the replacement singer in Moxie. I think that's about all I got. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you guys. I, I had a blast tonight. It's it's good to finally get this list done. Um, I've been sitting on this for over a month. Yeah, we all, we've all sat on this list for over a month. I'm glad to have finally done it. Thank you, guys. Try so, as it. usual, we'll just uh, talk about what we got going on. Harrison, what do you got going on at Mad Metal Man, WordPress.com? Uh, just the usual stuff. I'll have the great recap of 2021 done, you know, for the end of the year. Um, you guys won't get to see this for a very long time, but... Um, I just recently made a mix CD, uh, which has HBD Triple M as one of the tracks. Sorry, what? Ha oh, happy birthday, Mad Metal Man. Yes. Um, you won't get to see that on Mix CD Monthly for a long time because I still have a couple to get through. But yeah, I just did that now. Nice. I won't be doing my... I usually do that stuff during the Christmas break. I start writing all my retrospective stuff during the break. John, as we mentioned, we, we got the Soto series starting up, what, first week of January? January 3rd. There you go. Um, so and yeah. a million other projects that you're balancing. Yeah, I got, like, next week will be a Cheap Trick and an Aerosmith. Um, and then an album ranking of the band Wigwam. Wigwam? Why yeah. do I know that name? It's a Norwegian band. Um, I forget the name. The singer's name is very hard to pronounce. Uh, they're just they're a glam rock band cool all right um, really like them so I, I needed to do one uh, thing on them so yeah um you know i have my year-end list coming up but it's it'll be the week of christmas to new year's yeah I'm traditionally i list. do my stuff after christmas and before new year's yeah um and i, I as for me personally i've just started my def leopard series just started this yeah. week with on through the night and that will, I'll probably take, if I'm going to plan on doing it every Monday. I don't know. I don't know. Most of next year. And I'm going to start a second series inspired by John uh, <laughs> in two ways. But because this guy can balance two series, I'm going to take a shot at it myself. And I am going to be reviewing the massive 40 plus disc Judas Priest box set. Yes. But I've already reviewed everything they've already released. So I'm going to be doing this in a sort of a shortcut fashion. I don't need to do the studio albums the same way again. So yeah, like parts kind of, 1 to 23 will be like one post. I think yeah. so. Something like that. But there's enough extra material in that box set to make it a decent length series. Oh, yeah. And of course, talking about the box itself. Um, so I'm going to try to... In 2023, I'm going to have hopefully two series going simultaneously that'll both rock. And I'm looking forward to that. Um, that's all about uh, I got cooking. Um, I did want to take a closer look at your Galvatron figure. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John won't be too interested in this, but yeah. Oh. <laughs> very, very comic accurate, cartoon accurate. Yeah. Now, that looks it, like the best Galvatron figure yet. Yeah, it is the best yet. It's not perfect, but... You know, considering the quality of Galvatron figures before now, you know, this is pretty darn good. I've also still have my, my G1 is still mint. Yeah. It's still mint. I have Cyclonus. I, a... This guy's a masterpiece, basically. Like, no backpack, perfect animation accuracy. Like, he's just a downscaled masterpiece figure. And then just <laughs> recently, I got his left hand man, Sc Scourge. Right. This is actually the sweet deco of the mold, but they're. They're identical in terms of sculpt. It's just, just the face deco. deco. Uh, not even the face is the same. It's the, the sweep just has a more toy accurate uh, blue, okay. and Scourge has an animation accurate blue. But I don't think it's good. You know. Oh, and the sweep's wings are painted. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm messing with that. But um, yeah, 
so the sweeps technically got more paint on it and you know when you only have one of them it doesn't matter what color it is because it's just scourge and see this is where my problem lies those are clearly the best versions of those figures released to date mm -hmm. clearly hands until down. they get a masterpiece because takara doesn't like yeah takara doesn't seem to like touching season three when it comes to masterpiece figures no because they don't know what to do as far as making them cartoon accurate and still mm -hmm. transformable but mm -hmm. um you know if i didn't already have one galvatron figure already which is the titan's return yeah <laughs> and if i didn't already have two versions of scourge already and two versions of cyclonus already i would i would jump on those but uh don't yeah, worry chris I, we'll, we'll let yeah. john go soon we'll let john go i soon. picked the bet the right time to start collecting just as all these great versions came out yeah you did i'm envious there hmm. anyway I had a blast tonight, guys. I'm. I want to do a show next week. We don't have to decide on the theme right away, but uh, I want to do. A, I want. I want to continue doing shows through the rest of December. So uh, you know, if you guys That's are available, two ideas we need. We have several, but let's. Uh, we'll save that for offline. Um, you guys want to hear a song before as we uh, head out? What do you want to hear? What do you want to hear? How about some Max okay. the Axe with the replacement oh. singer? I was about to say got the time, but never mind. Oh, we can do got the time, but that doesn't fit the uh, replacement singer vibe. I know. You want to hear got the time? We haven't heard that in a while. All right, let's do got the time. All right, so this is Clockwork Orange with got the time, which was done sort of an homage to Anthrax's version with replacement lead singer Joey Belladonna. <laughs> See, I worked it in. I somehow worked it in. <laughs> uh, you guys have a great night, and I'll talk to you both real soon. All right. Thanks a lot. Yep. Take care, yeah, everybody. Yeah, Rock and roll. Get in my head. Get in my head.